Hi, and welcome everyone. Such a fantastic uh, way to start our talk. Um, we, we're gonna, we, are, we have the, the honor and the pleasure to host uh, Alan Deeper, Dippert, excuse me, Alan Dippert. And um, everyone I say we, I mean the Cycloge uh, community. And um, my name is Daniel uh, Shmulevitz, and and I'm I was I was asked to moderate this talk, so I will, I'm I'm so happy to that Daniel Slutsky reached out to me, and that I get to, to do that because I know Alan from way back, if I can say that. Uh, I rem I remember Alan's work uh, when uh, we were I was dabbling in closure, and he came up with a uh, very ambitious front-end frame framework called Hopham. Um, and we will see what was impressive uh, about it was that it, it was based on a completely different um, uh, architectural principle that we were used to. Uh, so I, I don't remember, I think it was the React frameworks were, were, were strong at the time, or maybe it was even before that when, when there were other, other frameworks. Uh, JavaScript frameworks um, are strong, but at, at, at any case, the idea of using the the paradigm of of a spreadsheet and its reactive functional model to to render a, a, a front end was really novel at the time. Uh, even and 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 testament to the fact that today you we, we see this a little bit more. Uh, but it, it was uh, the first time I, I, I heard about uh, this kind of um, mapping of, of a concept onto uh, web frameworks. So I, I, at the time, I already um, was, was uh, convinced that uh, Alan was a man of ideas, and he confirmed this all the time because he, he managed to, to, do, to, come, to come up with novel ideas Again and again, if I may say so, um, uh, because uh, the next next thing uh, Alan was doing uh, uh, was uh, the boot uh, uh, bit framework, and that was also very interesting uh, architecturally, um, because it solved a couple of problems that we we had with the traditional build tools in, in lining them performance-wise, but also um, it was based on the idea that a build tool doesn't necessarily has, uh, has to be declarative. And it came up with the idea of giving the full power of closure uh, while, while writing uh, the, the build programs, the extension to the build tool. And that was very novel also and very interesting because normally build tools are either declarative or they have a DSL that you use to extend it. Uh, and, 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 and boot uh, was very elegant architectural solution which gave you the full power of closure. So you might think that uh, Alan Dippert was uh, happy in closure land, but next time uh, uh, <laughs> you hear about him and it's about in the context of R. Uh, and that is, that, is, that is what I like about Alan, it's that it's not, it's, not, it's not just about one community, one language. Um, this this, 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 uh, this um, poly, you know, polyglotism, if I may say, you know, the ability to, to uh, learn multiple languages and juggle with uh, multiple languages. Poly the name of polyamory even, is that the same <laughs> thing? Different thing. That's, that's awesome, yeah, polyamory. Um, this idea of uh, using languages for in the context, uh, in, the, in the right context, and, and the idea to uh, to be able to move along and not to, to to be more married to the idea and the concepts behind what you're doing than 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 the the particular uh, implementation that you're using. Uh, this 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 uh, this is uh, for me a sign of uh, maturity in terms of uh, developers. So I think now it's the time to to see what kind of audience we have because this is this is uh, these these insights are very useful to to uh, to to people who begin uh, in their or beginners or, or 
uh, people who, who are uh, busy learning their first language because there is also always a first language um, and you have to master it before you can start juggling with concepts and, 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 and ideas. So uh, that is one thing. But the other thing is that Alan also uh, is going to talk about a project which is uh, uh, in a, yet another language, common list, uh, uh, although it's the same family of languages. But uh, the question now is uh, the, about the audience. We would like to know two things. And uh, please uh, use the chat to, to answer the, the question. The first, um, the first question is, uh, is about the experience of everybody here. So to know uh, how experienced the, the audience is in terms of career de uh, as a developer. So maybe you can put in the chat uh, how, how long you've been programmed. Um, thank you. Okay, 20 years for Garibaldi Capital Devices. 10 years professionally, seven years, six years, six years, 27 years. So we have, uh, I would say three years, six times. <laughs> and everybody's kind of, uh, okay, we have a, a, okay. Alan, your audience is uh, made of uh, experienced developers, which maybe shouldn't be too surprising because this is not the kind of meetup uh, you stumble upon if you start. But anyway, uh, now we know. Uh, and then the second question is, what is your daily uh, driver in terms of language? Because we have maybe, we have certainly closure people, which I recognize, but we might, ha might have uh, common list people and we might have people who uh, write in other languages as well. So maybe everybody can type in what kind of programming language they use as a daily driver. And the question is just the daily driver because you might know multiple languages, but what, what is the, the main, your main language that you use? Okay, nice, nice. Uh, we have uh, Ruby, we have, we have uh, C++, we have Kotlin. Um, we have Clojure and Python also. Uh, so, so that's nice. Common list also. Your script, that's cool. Yeah, okay, so so great, thank you very much. And I, I will now um, leave the podium, if I may say so, uh, <laughs> to, to Adam, take, take it on Adam, thanks. And let me simulate coming up. <laughs> oh, thank you, Daniel. A uh, very humbling and flattering introduction. Uh, I cannot take full credit for Boot or Hoplon. Um, my long time friend and collaborator, Misha Niskins here on the call. So that's the reason I have to be honest about it. Uh, he and I um, <laughs> designed those, all those things together. So, um, but yes, thank you so much for the opportunity to come here and speak. And um, I was telling the Daniels before the call, uh, preparing for things like this is always really fun because, you know, it, I'm sure you've heard it said the act of writing is kind of a vehicle for thought and for honing your thoughts. And every time I have an opportunity to introspect and crystallize and share, I feel like I gain new insights for myself. So I'm grateful very much for this opportunity. And I hope I'm able to share something of value and if not a value of interest, and if not of interest, at least you'll find it mildly funny. <laughs> so, Without further ado, let me uh, get my slides going here. Try a little screen sharing. Uh, share screen. Okay, is everybody seeing a slide? Yeah. Great. So yes, if uh, you have any questions later or just want to get in touch, you can reach me at these coordinates and I'll share these slides um, as well. they will be distributed and they have real links and so forth. Um, yeah, 
So uh, Daniel has done a fantastic job of biographying me, but um, I can fill in some gaps and paint that picture a little more. I think this is important because, uh, and I'll get elaborate more on this, but I don't think you can understand things in the world without understanding why they matter to other people. And to do that, you have to know a little bit about the other people um, and you know it, understand where they're coming from a little bit. So that's my goal here. So I've been using Clojure since 2009. I learned it when I was a student and I had the uh, enthusiasm of the new convert big time because it seemed like Clojure was the end all be all and I couldn't believe people were using Java that was ridiculous and preposterous and there was no way I was gonna do anything except Clojure. And as foolish as that perspective was, it turned out to pay pretty huge dividends for my career and for my friend circles and everything because um, going all in on something is valuable. You know, you make these lifelong friends and connections. You uh, are exposed to ideas that you can use to compare other ideas to later. And I know anyone who's learned closure pretty much compares anything anybody tells them about to closure, right? I mean, it's like, okay, what doesn't this do that closure does better? And it is kind of like after you know closure, that's kind of the standard you hold. Um, at least I did for a while and tempered somewhat there. Um, but yeah, I was you know heavily invested in the language, the community, and then uh, added, participated in the creation of new tools and infrastructure and libraries and stuff. Um, around 2016, I made a career change. It seemed like there was an opportunity for me to apply the skills and the knowledge I'd accumulated in the closure community in a new context uh, in the R world and more broadly in scientific computing. And I think this is, this is a trend, uh, the concept of data scientists, the concept of scientific computing. I remember when I was in college, scientific computing meant like grid computing with C and MPI and stuff like that. And I vaguely was aware that this was going on. I never participated in it. But I think since then, the concept of data science has opened up significantly to the point where um, we have a category of person who is a new programmer who needs to explore data. And that's interesting because I think that's pretty much the same kind of person as someone who's using a, a dynamic language for the first time, programmer or not. You know, it's all about working your way through dad data, finding patterns, defining patterns, uh, carrying yourself to new levels of understanding of the data, filling in the gaps with abstractions and so on. So this, this little period of my life when I was doing R and JavaScript and uh, immersed in the data science world was uh, really interesting. And my experience with Clojure paid off there. Um, <clears throat> in parallel to all of this, back in 2010, I was working at what was then Relevance and we had a concept of open source Fridays where we would do some open source stuff. Um, and we were paid to do that. And I was helping out with like low hanging fruit and closure itself. And closures plus function uh, and functions in closure generally support something called inlining. And what that means is in like syntactic instances of expressions like plus one, two can get replaced at compile time with a call to, I think it's closure math add or something like that. Like there's a Java static method underneath closures plus. And if you can replace the function call to plus with a direct call to the Java static method without any variadic arguments, then you get a slight performance improvement. And when I was studying that, I'd never seen anything like this before. It's like a, a dual headed function and macro because plus is a function, not a macro, but there is a, an understanding of a kind of macro that is applicable to even functions like plus. And so I, that was new to me. Uh, and it turns out the sound optimization is called broadly compiler macros. And this is a feature of common lisp. And that's where Rich got the idea, presumably. So he told me this and sent me over to the lisp documentation and I landed on something called the hyperspec, which I'll show you later. But uh, I was really impressed with the depth and breadth of the common Lisp documentation because beyond the hyperspec, you've got dozens of books and technical articles and academic articles. And I found myself getting kind of distracted by it and kind of being more interested in 
learning about common lisp and then making closures plus <laughs> as fast as possible. And I had to kind of consciously step back from the common lisp thing to get back to my work. But uh, that was my first glimpse. Um, since then, I have not used Lisp professionally at all. I'm like a, I'm, I'm an enthusiast. Uh, it's a hobby thing for me. Um, and I should say further that not only am I an enthusiast and not use it professionally, I don't even really know how you would use it professionally. I have vague ideas about, and I know more or less the affordances of the different implementations and so on. Um, but one of the things I would hate for anyone to take from this talk is I'm going to use common lisp at work because Alan Dyper told me to, and I don't, I don't want to be on the hook for that. Okay. The, the career consequences for you are undefined. Okay. So for me, this is a hobby. And by that same token, I'm not an expert at common lisp. I'm, if I'm closest to being something like an expert in closure, but I cannot claim to be an expert in common lisp. And I think uh, lack of real production experience is probably what keeps me from that. Um, but maybe in the future, it'll be something I'll be able to pursue. It's certainly an aspiration. Um, for the moment, I am still a closure programmer. Uh, I came back from the R world about a year ago. I switched jobs and now uh, I, well, I technically work for myself, but I have customers who have me doing closure and JavaScript, which I enjoy and it's great. And um, yeah, closure is, closure is awesome. <clears throat> so broad stroke agenda here. Uh, yeah. I. I it's been many years since I first saw Common Lisp, and I'm still interested and excited about it. And I don't really know why that is. Like, I don't really know why. Uh, I think it's good, and I like it, and I'm marginally obsessed with it. It's funny because my interest in this has really confused and surprised a lot of my friends in the closure community and even in the R community. Like, what what do you see in this? Um, so, some of the time I'm looking at this stuff, I think. Maybe, maybe I'm just going crazy. Like maybe I have a brain tumor or something like that, but um, you know, I don't have any other symptoms. So <laughs> I think it really is just, it's interesting. Um, so I hope to convey why I, why I think it's interesting. And, and this is the introspection I, I mentioned earlier that I, that I did that I haven't done is I've known I've been afflicted with this like obsession, but I haven't really thought about why I'm so interested in it. And so I hope to share that. Um, the other thing is context. I think I mentioned, you know, if you want to understand an idea, it helps a lot to understand the people behind it and what motivated them to do stuff. Um, and I don't think Common Lisp, Common Lisp does, it was not designed by one person, first of all. And none of the people who promote it now lay claim to it or are particularly invested in its future directly. Uh, I mean, everybody's a part of the community, but the, nobody has special standing the way that Rich Hickey has special standing in the closure community. So you hear a lot of different um, versions of why Common Lisp is good, and you hear Common Lisp explained in a lot of different ways. Um, but the people who originally designed it are more or less out of the public sphere. They're retired, get, you know, playing it, playing it slow. Um, so you don't hear much about what motivated the people originally to make it. So. I'm not that person, obviously. This was, I mean, com the design on Common Lisp started before I was born. And the stuff that, the, the other lists that Common Lisp are based on existed decades before I was born. So I can't, I, I'm not going to be that person, but I have read a lot of that stuff. And so I hope to share some of, some of what I run into that I thought was informative. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of activity in Common Lisp right now. Not as much as in Clojure, not as much as in probably any other language you've heard of, <laughs> but it's there and it's really exciting, I think, um, because the foundation is so solid. And well, there's a lot of reasons for causes for excitement that I'll get into. Uh, what this definitely isn't is the kind of talk where I'm trying to shoehorn these into some kind of dichotomy. Um, Daniel mentioned early that, you know, I'm polyamorous or poly, poly, polytheistic, polylingual. Um, I'm down for all these ideas. I have recognized great personal benefit from investing heavily in one thing, which I did with Clojure for like 10 years. But I think there's also a tremendous benefit in recognizing that it's, it's possible to like multiple things at the same time. And, you know, we don't have to be fully invested. And I think this is a message more for junior people and my former self. I don't think anyone here probably is... Would, would disagree with this. 
Um, so yeah, both closure and common list can exist at the same time and both be amazing at the same time. And we can, uh, we can uh, have, you know, recognize and realize great benefits from holding both in our heads at the same time and, and maybe even switching between them when it's convenient. Okay, <clears throat> so why are we here? Why am I, why, why is this meeting worth your time? And I think it's because Common Lisp is not going anywhere. It is gonna wait for you for the rest of your life to learn without changing. Um, and that's because it's a standard. It, it's already agreed upon, it's in the books. You know, they, there's a thing, there's a plate, the, the standards organization keeps it on file. Um, so whether you learn it today, tomorrow, next year, or on your deathbed, it's gonna be the same. <laughs> And to me, as someone who spent a lot of time in the web development world and at the mercy of people who change libraries for reasons that aren't in alignment with my own interests or business purposes, that's very refreshing because um, it's kind of part of nature now. It's not a product. It's not even an instance of a thing that exists on a disk. It's literally a standard. Um, and still it has value. And I think that's because the fundamental problems of programming have not changed since people started programming. The human brain hasn't changed. The user interface, the, you know, the, the human computer interface hasn't changed. We still have keyboards, symbols, letters. We use natural language in identifiers. Um, we can more, you know, it's not like people now can hold more ideas in their head at the same time as people in 1981. Um, and the same kinds of things that humans find intuitive and natural and the same ways that people think generally are all the same. And so these are the affordances of a language and Common Lisp offers these affordances and it tackles these problems still. Um, so there's value there, clearly. The other interesting thing about it compared to most other language implementations and design initiatives is the amount, the sheer amount of experience that went into this thing. Um, usually pe when people from Clojure or even the Scheme community talk about Common Lisp, they sneer at the legacy, you know, the, the problem of backward compatibility. Um, but the flip side of that, the benefit of a legacy is that everything there was put in for a reason at some point. So it might bother you now that the interfaces aren't perfectly uniform, but who's to say that your perfectly uniform interface won't be corrupted in the future when you decide to use it. And considering that all of the problems are the same, it seems to me unlikely that you're never gonna have to corrupt whatever idea you have for abstraction now in the future. So why not just start with the set of corruptions from prehistory <laughs> and build up from there, um, knowing full well with your eyes open that these are compromises and that just hindsight doesn't free you from having to make compromises. So, um, and yeah, it, I think it's interesting. I don't, I'm not sure people come together. I'm, I'm not aware of any more recent examples of people with this depth of programming experience coming together from such wide parts of the programming world to make something and to pour their experience and their interests into something. Um, so I think Common Lisp is singular as, as an artifact. Um, yeah, so TLDR, Common Lisp is a great thing to learn because it's not going anywhere. It's not gonna change. Whatever you learn about Common Lisp today in this meeting is gonna be applicable in 10 years. Whatever code you write is probably gonna work. Um, and that's what, circling back to me and my interest, my obsession. Like when I first got back into Common Lisp in 2016, I was programming and reading about it probably like two or three nights a week before bed, like three hours a week or something like that. And that's been an ebb and a flow. Like I'll pick those projects up three months later, six months later, a year later. Um, and I don't perceive, like I'm in no rush. And it's been really honestly delightful. I and mean, that's partly that's the delight of a hobby project is there's no business pressure, you know. Um, but it's also partly because uh, I'm confident these things aren't going to change and I can really learn at my own pace in a way that um, is difficult to do with other things that change more frequently. So when I talk about the trade-offs and the history and stuff, um, not only was Lisp designed by people with a really depth, deep, really deep and wide experience, 
but we have some visibility in the modern era into those experiences. And there's a few different sources of information. Uh, this is an email from the original, I believe it's the original multi-institution design mailing list. So there were people from MIT, Stanford, Symbolics, all the major players of the early 80s. And they were on an email list and they discussed fundamental design problems. And uh, we have visibility into those discussions. Some of the discussions are, are kind of contentious. Um, some of, some of, a lot of the times they're referring to meetings they had in person. And so you don't get the full picture, but it, it's nevertheless, it's a window. Like here's an example that I pulled up. This is an email from somebody at MIT about, they're talking about common list of language, probably the first edition, which was, um, it's like a 1200 page book. That was a, uh, a draft of the specification that guy Steele put together in, I think 1981 or 82. And that book circulated around at these different institutions and they would read it and think about it and prototype things. And then they would communicate to each other on this mailing list. So this guy's asking about the thing for making a hash table uh, takes a test keyword argument. Uh, and one of the equality comparators is, is missing. You know, why is that? It seems like it should be in there. And so people respond to him. Um, Separately, there is this thing called the hyperspec, which I mentioned, which is a hyperlinked documentation of everything, more or less everything in common list. So anything that's named in common list has represented somewhere in the hyperspec. Um, this is not the specification. This is a proprietary view of the specification with examples that was put together by Kent Pittman, who's one of the original Lisp luminary people from MIT. Um, <clears throat> So this, this basically is like a Java doc for Lisp. And you can see why that is. You get your arguments, your return value, your description, and then a little bit of high level overview. But the interesting thing is that these Java doc things link to design issues and represented in the set of design issues is a reference to the problem we saw from the design mailing list, which is um, they had like a committee discussion about which equality constructs hash tables should support. Um, so you can, if, you know, if you have a problem with why common Lisp does it this way, you can find the source. And, uh, I think, I think that's really cool. Uh, I think very few things that we use that are designed to give you this kind of visibility into the why and how and the context. <clears throat> uh, and that's actually not fair to Python with the peps and stuff like that. Like this is, this tradition is alive. Um, but I think, uh, Common Lisp is an instance of it, which is for its for its for its benefit. Um, so, circling back to closure, what is the killer feature of closure? This is a this is a subjective question. You know, I mean, some people really like the Lisp syntax aspect of it. Uh, certainly, the immutable connect collections. We're getting a few questions. Oh, so uh, proprietary view, the, the, the hyperspec is a document with a copyright and that copyright belongs to a company and the copyright does not allow arbitrarily copying and pasting the hyperspec. So while the constructs that the hyperspec mentions are, are free and open and you can talk about them in any normal way, uh, you can't, for example, take the text of the hypertext or of the uh, hyperspec and copy it into your program or, you know, make a new website called Alan's hyperspec uh, where I've just replaced all instances of Ken Pittman with Alan diaper or all instances of common Lisp with, you know, rainbow unicorn or whatever. Does that answer your question, Tori? No problem. So yeah, killer feature of closure. Java interop, Java interop, that's huge. But I think the killer feature is Rich Hickey. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because Rich Hickey 
yes, he made a language. Yes, he put all these features together, but there's a consistent philosophy behind the language. And most importantly, Rich makes it very clear upfront why he's doing what he's doing. So when anyone comes to Clojure, they're not looking at individual features. They're connecting with this person and his story and his needs and his philosophy. And once you're holding that in your head, then all the features and stuff in Clojure fall out naturally. Like you can understand his perspective and why he made the decisions he did. And that empowers you to really design closure for yourself um, in a way that also is, I think, rare. Uh, generally, when people are promoting technology, they talk about specific features. Or um, if you're lucky, they'll talk about you know, stories, um, like user stories or case analysis. Uh, what do they call that? Case studies. Um, but you don't really get a holistic fundamental view. Part of that is because uh, it's really rare for, for large intellectual artifacts in computing to be really designed by one person that's pretty rare even you know most most things are designed by small groups of people um, but this really is a one person thing and so because it's a one person thing you have unprecedented visibility into why and um, i think it's great i i'm this this was new to me like i when i when i learned closure this was very compelling to me because it seemed like i had to learn java just because that's what everybody learned and if I wanted to do stuff on Linux, I had to learn C because that's what everybody does. But neither of those things came with this deep philosophical historical background. And so that I, was, I was almost shocked by this. I'm giddy. And I think all these things are still on YouTube. And this is a great reason to, to use Clojure today still. And I, it's awesome. Um, so yeah, you know, Rich is big on, on rationale and, and doing things with intent. And in an open source project, this is critical because uh, the intent messages to people whether or not they want to have anything to do with your thing, whether they want to help you. You know, Are you in alignment with what they want? Um, if you don't have this rationale, then you get pull requests that you have to shut down, <laughs> which makes everybody feel bad. So it's better to say what you're going for and let people come to you rather than not say what you're going for and people come to you with ideas that aren't in alignment with your own. And you know, for himself, I know I, Rich did this for himself. This was this is the outcome of years of his own thinking and research. Um, and it's great. Uh, and um, Lisp doesn't or Common Lisp doesn't have a document like this. Like there isn't a Common Lisp rationale document. Part of that is because there is no single person who could have written it. Um, the other part of it is a lot of their rationale was implied to themselves at the time. So you can piece something like this together for yourself if you do the research and you can find it in the emails and the hyperspec and the issues lists. Um, but it's not all in one place like this, but I think this is very powerful. All right, the champion. So that's where I introduce myself. I'm the champion. I'm the hero of this talk. I'm the person who's, who's uh, distilling all the context uh, for you all. And I, I'm certainly joking. Uh, there is no such person, but there is room for such a person to pretend to be such a person, which is what I'm doing now. Um, oh, this slide is mangled. So a little light criticism of closure is in order. Uh, I still use and love closure. Um, but one of the things in the rationale is uh, emphasis on functional programming, which I think anyone here would agree is a good thing. But there is no free lunch. You know, every every design decision comes with a set of trade-offs. And um, in one interview, Rich described Clojure as uh, a programming language that inhabits a place in the set of possible designs that he really likes and wants to be in. So it's a multi-dimensional space. Uh, he made a few design decisions that took him to a particular place that he likes, but um, maybe it's not the best place for other people to be in. So one of the tenets of Clojure is functional programming. And as the basis for that, Clojure has a really comprehensive sense of, of equality, general, generalized equality. Um, but that in itself is a trade-off because arbitrary comparison between arbitrary pieces of memory uh, requires some heuristics to be applied uh, because there is no 
universal mathematically sound definition of what something is. So whoever's designing that has to make some cuts. Um, and yeah, uh, sorry, I skipped to the fourth bullet. But with, with regard to the first bullet, um, when I was originally in use closure, the concept of everything as data was very refreshing because I was used to needing to write really obtuse Java programs. Um, and the other end of it, the, the idea that you could describe things as data was really empowering. But as I doubled down on that approach and continued in my career, I realized, well, if even if you put data together, you still have to interpret it somehow. And uh, you're going to need code to do that. And sometimes the kind of interpreter you're going to write looks suspiciously like a Lisp interpreter. Hiccup is an example of this. It's like, huh, this is kind of like a Lisp in a Lisp. At first, I thought it was really cool. But then as I matured, I thought, um, I wonder if this might be going backward a little bit, because I've heard it said that you know, any system evolves into Lisp. Uh, Greenspun's 10th, 10th rule, you know, any any large system is a ad hoc, incomplete version of common Lisp. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I'm subject to that enclosure world. Um, and yeah, th I think there's an emphasis on keywords in Clojure as a result. Like keywords are a really dominant part of most Clojure programs. And arguably they form a namespace because they're global. They can have multiple meanings and be used for multiple different purposes in a program. Uh, and that's a trade-off. Um, same with polymorphism. You know, Clojure has several different mechanisms for polymorphism. There's protocols, multi-methods, um, various library contributions like spec for pulling apart, dispatching on pieces of data structurally. Uh, you know, each of those is that is code that's going to be on disk and code that's going to be in memory. Um, and also the burden of choosing which one to use is on the programmer. So it's all a set of trade-offs. Uh, overall, though, I, I mean, I'm still really grateful for the spot on the design space that Clojure inhabits here because it is unique and it is very, very powerful. Like it's really, it's very easy to make things that are likely to work on the first try and are just conceptually nice. It feels nice. So um, that's it for the light criticism. Uh, I can't really, criti and, and, and the, other, the other point is I can't really criticize the design of Clojure because I, you know, it was made for its time and place and I'm in a different time and place. So it's not fair. Um, <clears throat> so this isn't really criticism, criticism so much as revisiting some of the points in Clojure's rationale in the modern era. So Clojure, this, the, the, most of the Clojure rationale is I think written 10 or 15 years ago and certain truths about the computing landscape have changed since then. Um, one of them is that Docker and the cloud have put renewed emphasis on operating systems. And I think you see things like Alpine Linux uh, and various other custom OS abstraction layers for use in cloud environments. Um, I don't think it's the case that VMs are the future, I, but I think technology and approaches that are in VMs are proliferating into OSs and into infrastructure. Um, JIT is an example of this. So, you know, 15 years ago, uh, Hotspot was, and maybe Lua, I, Lua JIT came a little later, but it was a pretty new idea. Um, but the idea of a JIT was more or less proven in 1999 at HP. And what they did there is they uh, made a JIT compiler for an architecture, I forget what it was. It was like a alpha processor, I believe. And they wrote a JIT for the alpha processor that compiled into code for, for a real alpha processor. And so they had a program that emitted alpha processor machine code. And then they fed that into their alpha processor JIT, which emitted code for an alpha processor. And the code running on the JIT was faster than the machine code <laughs> if you ran it just by itself which made it clear that JITs could be, could do, could add value regardless, like even at the machine code level, like the concept of tracing 
and hot reloading and stuff, and or you know, um, moving code motion and all that stuff. Like there was value there even at the machine level, and um, that kind of smarts is moving further into the computer as we see with Apple's M1 chip. That thing is basically like a little hotspot on it, um, but it has a full view of memory and and, and stuff going on in the computer. Um, the, the other trade-off with JITs, uh, which was true even 15 years ago, is uh, they make it harder to reason about the performance envelope of a particular function because something that to you might seem intuitively fast might actually have a non like a non-local effect of making something else that you thought would be fast slow because it gets kicked out of cache for example the code trace gets kicked out of cache because your thing now dominates in some way that uh, intrigues the jit so again i think this is something that is a trade-off uh, for most people using java it provides more benefits than problems but if you're really interested in reliable performance envelope like you really need to make sure that this function runs the same speed every time and there's various applications that need that then um, java and jits are not necessarily the right thing for you um, <clears throat> platform on platform issues i think this is this is still true uh, which is if you have different platforms with different memory models uh, like for example, if on lot one platform you have strings are mutable and on another platform strings are immutable, or you know there's 32 bits in a float, or there's you know, 32 bits in a uh, integer here, 64 bits in an integer here, um, you know you can see how that complicates fitting one thing to the other thing or setting one thing on top of the other thing, and you can imagine how there's inefficiencies that creep in there because you have to coerce and copy and and do stuff to make it all match up right. Um, which leads me to this key, another key contextual difference. Uh, and I, I think maybe a better term than context is situation. You know, Rich talks about the situational aspect of programming and how nothing really makes sense unless it's embodied or situated somewhere. Oh, yeah. Uh, I I'm, I'm not sure if there's a closure script rationale. I've actually, if you go to the first commit in ClojureScript, there's a uh, an org file, the original ClojureScript readme. There's a bulleted list for ClojureScript that's similar to the one for Clojure, but I don't know if it's um, I don't know if that's on the ClojureScript website. Oh, whoops. So, um, right, this is this is the big difference, really. Uh, Clojure is two things: the compiler and the runtime, built on a really pretty deep stack of other stuff. And this was a um, this is a tactical decision. Now you can imagine you're a person, you're a single person. You can only be awake for so many hours in the day. You can only type so fast, uh, but you wanna make a new programming language. Are you gonna define a new kind of computer and operating system to make that happen? No, you're gonna make a DSL. You're gonna do some prototyping. Um, and Rich, when he made Clojure, it was all him. You know, He had some ideas and he wanted to move as quickly as possible from those ideas to being able to use them professionally and industrially. Uh, you know, he had experience with C++ and Common Lisp industrially. He wanted to make those things go in a way that he could sell and in a way that he could start using like within his lifetime. So the platform aspect for him, um, just in terms of his time available to engineer stuff, certainly was really, really uh, key. Um, I should say also, I, I do, you know, I, I have worked with Rich and I have a personal connection to him, but I don't speak for him on any of these things. And I'm going based really only on information that he's made public or written about or spoken about, um, but which, with, with which he may now disagree. So again, I don't, I am not Rich Hickey. I don't speak for him, but this is my assessment of maybe why he made these decisions. Reading, reading between the lines a little bit. Common Lisp, on the other hand, much, much, much broader set of desired capabilities. Um, I have operating system at the bottom of the stack there, but even the earliest Lisps were really tightly integrated with the operating system. Um, uh, and the operating system was in some cases written almost entirely in Lisp. So even that boundary is not really very uh, uh, 
easy, you know, or, or, or obvious. Uh, Lisp, the idea you can use to describe a whole computer um, and where you want the, fun, the, the foundational stuff of the computer to end and Lisp to begin is kind of a, a design, design decision. Um, but Common Lisp was not architected to take on the problems of the operating system. So uh, some things are absent from the spec and are provided by third parties or implementations now. Threads is one of those. Um, C interop. CFFI is another one that's uh, platform uh, dependent, but you know it's been 20 years, so a, even a lot of these platform dependent things have converged on something like a standard that works across platforms, like the Thread standard board. There's a library called Bordeaux Threads, but nowadays most implementations provide their own native version and they all interoperate. And people in the community take interoperation between different implementations pretty seriously. Um, so yeah, it's a different thing. It's apples and oranges, really. Uh, going back to my second slide about, you know, is it, is which one is better? And it's like, they really are different significantly. Um, so we have all these abstractions in play and they exist at different levels in our tower. Um, and we have to choose which ones to build on and how to integrate them. And then this is the this is the work of design. This is what anybody who makes a language has to do. Um, Closure has a set embodies a set of perspectives on how to do this, that it delivers as a set of features or you know forms and runtime objects that we have access to. Um, oh, and you could say, and this is on this fourth bullet. I kind of roll this up and say. My own definition of abstraction is maybe hiding unnecessary details and emphasizing necessary concepts. So this is what makes things simple. Uh, and then things that are simple can be made easy, right? Um, but this raises the question, like, what is unnecessary? How does somebody else know what's necessary to me or not? Uh, and that's a good question. I think this is back to comes back to alignment. Like, are you trying to do the same thing that the person who made your language is trying to do. If you are, then you're probably going to come to the same conclusions as they did about what's necessary and unnecessary. If you're not, then you're going to feel like this thing is in your way. Um, certainly, when Rich designed Closure, he felt this way about Java. He thought, you know, this is these the the people who design Java have their priorities are all wrong. I don't want to program in this way, and I'm at odds with this way of programming. So I'm going to find my own way. Well, in Closure, because it inhabits that top part of the platform abstract uh, that the abstraction stack it's at the very top um, so a lot of decisions from top to bottom are already are made for you already um, but in common list you have more room to make your own decisions you have more leverage more rope to hang yourself <laughs> a lot more rope as an example of that um, common list does not explicitly does not have offer uh, a concept of um, general equality. Um, and that's intentional. Uh, the downside of it is that there's like half a dozen or more equality operators and they work on all different types. So this is exactly the kind of uh, legacy uh, corruption that people point at when they say common list doesn't have unified abstractions. Like it doesn't even have a single equal. Like, what's up with that? That's crazy. Um, but there's a reason for it. And that reason is in the hyperspec. And I think it's one of the issues attached to the equal P or equal. Um, and this is just philosophically true. There isn't a general way of comparing two places in memory for equality. Um, any choice you make about how to do that is going to suggest or imply other constraints on the system. And so in the interest of making as many things possible in common Lisp as, as they can, they decided not to make a decision about this. And what this means is that if you want something like closure style immutable structures with general equality, you're gonna have to make it yourself or use library. Um, and this goes back to the tension of platform versus language on top of a platform. This is common Lisp taking a stand as a platform and saying, we're not gonna approach this. We're gonna leave this to the, to the users. 
Uh, contrast with closures, uh, generally quality operator equal, um, which you can pretty much use intuitively in any context where you situation demands equality. Um, but there, there are a few costs associated with this convenience. Um, you need uh, the fourth one is maybe the the meatiest one, which is um, you know you can extend quality equality to your own new objects, but when you do that, you need to mutate the list of uh, equality comparator functions inside Closure itself, and that's what you're doing. That's effectively what you're doing when you're extending an interface in Java or if you're extending a protocol in Closure. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, Henry Baker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, in some of his early talks, uh, Rich references EGAL, and this is Henry Baker's attempt to, who was a, another original MIT Lisp person, to um, bring some sanity to common Lisp's equality operations, because he, he also was disgusted by the proliferation of equality functions, and he had an idea about how to make a better one, or at least a more comprehensive one. Uh, but there are trade-offs associated with his approach. Um, so yeah, you know, the nice thing about these abstractions is they changed the economy of using them. Um, and it's either to your advantage or your detriment, depending on what you're trying to do. And if you're trying to write a hot, you know, numeric, numeric type loop or doing scientific computing, then, and you know you're always going to be working with a particular, you know, signed integer or whatever, then this may get in your way more than it helps you. Um, maybe. I mean, again, it's it's contextual. So if I were to like sum up the conceptual abstraction differences between closure, I would say, and common list, I'd say, you know, closure is like this tightly integrated, beautifully designed, internally consistent view of how to program. And in particular, how to program on a platform like Java or JavaScript. Um, Common Lisp, it evolved over a long period of time. It has amazing ideas in it. Those ideas are not especially artfully connected. Um, but where their connections dissatisfy, you can at least go find out why. There's always a place to figure out why, like what experience led to this? What was the discussion behind this? Why is it that way? And so it's a patchwork. It's a very broad patchwork. And so um, that makes it feel kind of weird coming from Clojure, honestly. And I think that's why when I would tell people that I came up with in the Clojure community, I tell them about Common Lisp, and I send them to the hyperspec and they see that it looks like, you know, copyright 1994. Like, what is this? Like, why are you <laughs> looking at this? And um, yeah, so it, it has a weird, a weird vibe. It's old timey, um, but it's lovable, endearing. And uh, again, will never change. So whatever time you spend learning it, it's going to pay a dividend on the long, the long tail. So I've got a list of things that I am interested in of late. Um, I think by far the one I'm most excited about is this project, which I'll see if I can open it up. Uh, Oh, cool. It's not loading. Anyway, um, there is a professor in France. His name is Robert Strand. He is a longtime Lisper, and he's known for many uh, libraries and initiatives in the common list community. And like Rich, he has dedicated a large part of his life to the pursuit of the kind of programming that he wants to do. And so there's always a lot to learn from such people. And um, there's a lot to learn from him in particular. He's given a lot of talks that are on YouTube. He's written a lot of papers. And all of his papers are really short and clear relative to other papers, even, even list papers. So uh, everything about this guy and his projects I'm super into usually. Um, there's an IRC channel on Freenode. It's the Sickle channel where you can follow what he's doing. He checks in every morning and he says, good morning, everyone. This is what I'm working on today. So you have like. It's, it's kind of exciting. I, I, I'm never, I'm rarely able to offer him any kind of feedback, but I always try to register my interest and support. Um, 
but he has a really comprehensive and well-designed plan to write a new implementation of Common Lisp and <clears throat> for his implementation to have properties that no other implementation does. Principally, um, well, two things, the benefit of hindsight, like the hindsight of multiple implementations. Uh, most of the implement implementations today are, are um, descended from implementations of the 80s and early 90s uh, that have built into them certain assumptions about you know, what's efficient. Um, most of them do not use common lists, highest level abstractions in their implementation. So they're not, strictly speaking, they're meta circular because they are written in Lisp, but they're not fully object oriented using Lisp's best object oriented constructs. And uh, I'm sorry to use that word, but in Lisp, it's a good word, trust me. Um, so his idea is make a new implementation written in the highest possible level common list that he can, and then bootstrap from the existing implementations. So what you end up with and what he has is a set of libraries that sum up to an implementation. They're just all beautifully written. Um, and his implementation of one of common list standard macros, the loop macro is what got me into sickle originally. So I can't, I can't recommend his stuff or things related to this project enough. It's like a great source of really high quality um, information. And it's exciting because uh, I think it was last week or the week before he was able to use sickle to either to load and compile a large part of a package called Alexandria, which is like common Lisp standard third party utility package. And this is like many thousands of lines of common Lisp using a lot of esoteric features. Um, and so when he was able to load that up, he announced it in IRC and I got really excited because I thought, oh, I might be able to use Sickle in my lifetime for sure. Like maybe even in the next couple of years. <laughs> so that's fun. Um, Jackal is my, I mean, certainly in comparison to Sickle, hobby, pet thing. I don't work on this every day. I don't even work on it every week. It's a long-term bet. And a lot of it is educational for me, but this is uh, an attempt to bring the common Lisp platform, or at least parts of it to JavaScript and to think about those platform impedance issues that I mentioned having to do with lining up the data types and lining up the abstractions and use cases and so on. And so there's a paper that I wrote about that that uh, that uh, illuminates that. And uh, I, I, still, I still poke at that. Most recently, I've been working on multiple value return support to be efficient in there, which is a thing I'll talk about. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave these other things for you to explore. Uh, one thing I will emphasize, or one thing I'll highlight is Peter Norvig. So Peter Norvig, long time Lisper and also Lisp's most famous defector probably because he famously switched from after doing decades of common Lisp and AI for AI research to using Python. And um, I think that confused and saddened many people in the Lisp community. Um, but if you click on this video, he's interviewed on a podcast, I think two years ago, and he gets into why he did that. Uh, and he has a very nuanced perspective and he's a really smart guy. So uh, any opportunity to watch him speak about Lisp or anything else is, you know, I recommend. Um, I think I'm at a good place to stop. Uh, this is the end of my slides. My plan was to give you these slides to give you some background and then we can, whatever time we have, we can use for discussion or questions or I can do little demos of things. Uh, sure. Um, that, that was a delightful uh, talk. I could hear you talk uh, so much uh, longer. You could go forever. <laughs> um, what a joy, what a pleasure, really. Thank you. And uh, I want to say hi to uh, Micha, who came because I didn't have the, uh, the opportunity. And uh, it's good to see you also. I just want to mention that uh, at, at a certain time when uh, uh, Alan and Micha were doing the booth project, um, that's when I, I got to contribute a little bit of my own. And I want to say that it was always such a um, a nice interaction with uh, the host and anybody who is doing open source 
uh, know how difficult it can be to you know interact with people the community and 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 and, and make sure that uh, interactions happen on a on a, on a human level um, that is agreeable to everyone and you really did a spectacular job uh, uh, not only for myself I, I was just also observing you how you were interacting with the community and it was really a joy so um, kudos to you and, and thank you um, Thanks. so yeah so I think uh, we, we, we could uh, go on and, and um, uh, go go uh, see what uh, what the uh, what kind of questions we have from the audience? Do it. So anyone? Yeah, go ahead, shoot. Sammy, hi. <laughs> Somebody wanted to, to I, I heard a duk, so leave it song. Who was that? <laughs> Svante, no? Uh, sorry, um, I, I was just uh, trying to type into uh, oh, okay. <laughs> the chat. Uh, I can I can just ask it uh, <laughs> live if you want. Sure, sure. Please, yeah. Yeah. Um. I. I actually, I. I um. I, I think it's uh, you made a great introduction. Um. Because uh, one thing uh, where I also wrote uh, it's a great slide. Um. Where you could see um. Uh, common list which more or less takes the whole stack from bare metal to space or uh, <laughs> um you, you can you can work on on the uh, in lisp yeah you, you're still in this but you can work on, on the nitty-gritty compiler details where you get uh i don't know uh, your virtual operations into the registers of your of your processor uh up to highest abstractions uh, whatever and it's all inside of lisp and there's also um several attempts to to to, to start new um common list um uh, uh, operating systems uh, so that you really get from bare metal to whatever. Um, uh, the most recent that I'm aware of is uh, Netzano, which uh, seems to make uh, some progress recently. Um, what uh, what I wanted to ask actually was um, what are the details? So, so, so the, some 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 features, something like uh, well, of course I have some ideas about that, but. Um, um, what you, you think um, makes common lisp um, what you miss in closure what common lisp has well i'm not sure i'm i don't know if i miss it but i'm certainly aware of it is the REPL situation in these two things um i i should have had a slide for this it's an important point which is both of these languages are very REPL focused and what i mean by that is Everything about the language supports interactive development and everything about compilation and delivery it accounts for and admits, it allows for interactive development. So there's a strict concept of a top level form in both of these languages and the semantics of the top level form are the same whether you're pre-compiling or whether you're interpreting or whatever. And this is kind of subtle, um, but I think it's a property of the language that we take for granted that actually very few languages have, which is such a low-level compilation unit. Um, <clears throat> the trade-off here is, uh, Rich has spoken to this point in Hacker News threads about single pass versus multi-pass. And so Lisp compilers have always been single pass in the sense that you feed the, the top-level forms in and you accumulate a Lisp image inside the computer. So what you're doing is you're contributing code to a stable identity, which is the Lisp image. And you have certain assurances like if loading a top level form fails, your image isn't corrupt, for example. So it's like a transaction. Um, so both of the languages have that in common. And this is different from languages in the scheme tradition, um, which have, broadly speaking, and this is a generalization and I'm not a scheme expert, so feel free to correct me, but one of the things that you have in common Lisp and Clojure are first class packages or namespaces. So that Lisp image you're building up, it's introspectable. And there are, well, there are, you know, public entry points into the database of information contained in the Lisp image. And that's accessible from the REPL using various functions for looking at documentation. Um, there are 
third party programs like Lispworks that give you UIs on top of that. Um, and in, in Common Lisp, the, probably the most popular or third party UIs, Lispworks, but there are other ones. Uh, and then in Clojure, maybe Rebel is um, analogous. Um, so those are the ways that they're the same. One way that they're different is in terms of the platform tra uh, trade-off. So in Common Lisp, when you're at the REPL, um, there's, a con there's a sophisticated error handling system called conditions. And there's also a traditional idea of what a debugger can do. And one of the things a the average Common Lisp debugger can do is give you a Lisp REPL at a place in the call stack. So like if you, it would be like if you throw an exception in Java and instead of the stack unwinding and you seeing a stack trace, execution can actually be suspended in common Lisp and you can have a REPL at the place where the exception was thrown. So you can inspect local variables, you can write new code that gets run in that same stack context, um, which is pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And it's, I think, still unique among languages. Closure does not have that. You know, we have Java stack, we have Java exception semantics and Java stack traces. Um, and at one point when I was learning Common Lisp, I reflected on why I didn't really, even once I knew about the Common Lisp way, why I didn't miss it in Closure. And the best I could come to an explanation was the most of the Closure programs I was writing kept their important state in a database. So I was writing mostly web applications or writing applications that interacted with services. And so if I needed to restart my JVM, it was a bit of a pain, but it wasn't the end of the world. It's not like my data of record was in the heap and turning off the JVM was going to ruin my day. Um, 20 or 30 years ago, when Lisp machines were running 24-7 in AI labs and they had persistent object systems and the, the OS, the database, and your program were all in the same computer and, e and even in the same memory space, um, it was much more important that you had that depth of debugging capability, I think. This is, it's not like I have that experience again. I wasn't even born when people were programming this way. But my perception is that uh, one thing that has changed about the kinds of programming most people do is that we generally have databases now for managing transactional data. Um, but that hasn't always been the case. And when Common Lisp uh, first came into existence, um, it was really important to be able to do that kind of very, very surgical debugging because you might lose data if you didn't have an opportunity to do it right then. Um, and actually, you can see this in action. There's a YouTube video of a screencast of, um, I believe, Symbolics only employee right now. So there is a, still a Symbolics company, and they distribute uh, CDs of OpenGenera and VLM, which are their it's a, it's a Lisp machine, virtual machine, and the OS on top. And they actually employ someone who used to work at Symbolics. And he did a screencast at a meetup where he showed how he debugged the network driver or something like that. And it's pretty incredible because, like Svante is saying, you see him go from like the highest levels of abstraction, like you know, right-clicking and navigating hyperlinks, to like pausing in the stack inside the Ethernet or the network drive, the chaos net driver or whatever he was doing and like twiddling bits in there. And then like, this is like in the middle of, like he's actually, I, be, I believe it was actually like in the middle of a network transaction. It would be like pausing Linux inside a packet so that you could, you know, look at the packet or change what was gonna happen to the packet or something like that. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it, in our modern usage of languages that capability isn't as important. And part of it might be because uh, we've given up the need for that because we're, we have we're, we rely on the platform, you know, again to our benefit and our detriment. If that's depending on your perspective, but yeah, I, I'll 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 find a link to that video. It's pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, um, just adding to that, um, you mentioned the condition system, which I think is also a very defining thing. Um, there's a communist guy who. Um, uh, recently, uh, I think two or three months ago, um, just uh, wrote a little a, a Java library that implements the common Lisp condition system in Java. Ah. So if you if you're interested in that, I, I posted the link to the, to the chat. 
definitely check that out. Oh, Foe, yes. He wrote a book too, didn't he, recently? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right, right. Hmm, cool. Very cool. Can I, can I just ask um, um, the audience if um, we have common listeners here who would like to um, add anything from their own experience uh, and, and just, uh, you know, if, if, if you feel that if you want to say something, please do. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested and probably more, more, more people are. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'll just uh, offer a comment. Um, Adam, I, I think on your last slide, you had a list of things that you might talk about. One was the um, uh, symbols and the, and the package system. Um, when I so so I've, I had a background in Common Lisp when I was learning Clojure, and I found the way symbols worked in Clojure to be. I, I guess I came in with a bunch of assumptions that just weren't weren't true, and I, it took me a while to really understand how how Common Lisp so how Clojure symbols worked. Um, I think that they're they're quite a lot different to Common Lisp symbols. I just wondered if you had any. Any, um, I guess you've got some thoughts on that because of what was on your slide there. Yes, two thoughts. So first of all, uh, I don't know about you all, but when I was learning Clojure, the NS macro took me a really long time to become comfortable with. And I think I was thinking of it like, you know, Python's import syntax. I took the syntax for the thing, which, you know, as you learn Lisp, you realize that the syntax is the front end for the thing. And if you really want to understand the thing, you have to go beneath the syntax. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so I was pretty befuddled by the NS macro and I didn't have my head around the closure package system. And then I finally did. Um, and I think based on what I've read about the common list package system, I think there are a lot of the same, uh, at least people who are learning seem to have some of the same problems. But anyway, that's that's sort of neither here nor there. That doesn't address your question exactly. Um, yeah, the big difference, the specific technical difference between the reader, the symbol reader in Clojure and the symbol reader in Common Lisp is that the Common Lisp symbols are interned in the current package when they are read. So there's no concept of a, pa of a symbol without a package. And what this means is that you can be looking at a fragment of code in a particular global environment and you can see with your eyes things that look like they're the same symbol or you would assume them to be the same symbol. Um, like you would assume them to be EQ, like they're the same object, um, but they were actually interned in different packages and so they're not EQ. All, even though textually they may appear to be EQ and that's context dependent. And you can do, you can set up situations like that by um, you know, switching the package in a let binding, for example, because you can dynamically bind the current package, which changes. There's, there's just actually that's not that's not not a. That may or may not be true. Maybe I don't have my head around it completely, but <laughs> the big the big part is the mutation of the package. Uh, is what happens. So when you read a um, when you read a closure symbol, um, a if a symbol is associated with a package, that information is attached to the symbol in its symbol syntax. And we have namespace qualified symbols. Um, there's also a concept in Clojure of uh, referred symbols, which means that Clojure will interpret symbols that it reads without a package to be in a particular package. So you can establish a mapping between a Packet between a symbol that doesn't have a package and a package. And you can install that in your package, if that makes sense. <laughs> but the symbols themselves are not installed in particular packages. The, the package uh, environment is not mutated by the reader. And that if in the closure rationale, I think this is actually uh, mentioned specifically, Rich says something to the effect of, I don't like that the reader necessitates mutation because you know he believes strongly in data. And he believes strongly in um, uh, the idea that data should be uh, required, you know, data should not necessitate interpretation in any way. Um, that's my understanding of the key difference is the mutation of the packages when you're reading symbols. 
Um, follow on thought is that <clears throat> mutation uh, is contextual because if you have a functional programming language and you're doing a bunch of mutation inside a function and nobody outside of the function knows, then do we really care? And enclosure that idea is delivered with transients. Um, but I think it illustrates a more broad point, which is, you know, mutation is just a matter of perspective. Because when you run a program, you're mutating the call stack, you're mutating pixels on the screen, you know, um, regardless of what kind of program you claim to be, or claim to be doing. Um, so it's just a question of perspective. And um, in Sickle, Robert Strand, the professor, uh, he has a concept of first class global environments that he's written a paper about. But this encapsulates the mutation that I just described into another concept, another abstraction, a higher level abstraction called the first class global environment. And so now, yes, the reader mutates, but that mutation is limited to the first class global environment. So now is it really bad? I don't know. It's, again, it's a matter of perspective and trade-offs and so on. But uh, that's that, that, that first class global environment thing is kind of a recent development. I think he uh, is still working on that paper. So just for the, the YouTube recording, um, people who will not be able to read the chat, uh, Dave, Dave Yarwood has this, this uh, way of summarizing <laughs> this point. Uh, he writes, uh, if a var is mutated in a forest and nothing references it, does the value change? Right. Okay. And then we have uh, a nice, uh, uh, careful um, question. Uh, yeah. So I think we, we have to talk about it, even even though uh, if if you if you don't, <laughs> I mean, feel free to to uh, to, to skip it. But uh, it is interesting. I find I myself also a bit interested in what you might say uh, on this topic, and that is the. Uh, uh, Lisp one versus Lisp two. So um, right. Well, I, I think you have to address the fact that closure uh, that uh, that Rich Hickey coming from Common Lisp corrected. The, <laughs> the I think there's an argument that he made it worse. <laughs> so let me. Yeah, oh, no, th so, this is a fun topic wanna, again. We want to know. We want to know. Yeah, no. So this is right. another matter of perspective. I think um, you know there is a traditional. There's a classical understanding of what Lisp 1 versus Lisp 2 is, and it's limited to uh, the interpretation of symbols. Um, but, I'll, you know, there's a lot of dimensions of interpretation in a programming language, obviously. And if you it, add other types of atomic values, you know, atoms to this discussion, then for me, this point becomes less important. So for example, is closure a Lisp one? Well, let's think about this. What does a symbol mean? Well, a symbol can stand for a locally bound function, but it can also stand for a Java class, right? Because Java class names and closure symbols intersect. And so there is an if statement there in the reader, um, which is a source of complexity. Um, keywords, uh, in practice, closure libraries lean pretty heavily on keywords and even use keywords to invent new naming schemes, like to name, for example, subscriptions or uh, conditions, like the X info function. Um, a lot of people pass that a keyword to indicate, you know, to identify the condition or the exception they're throwing. So anytime people use those identifiers, they've created their own global naming scheme with their own interpretate, you know, their own semantics there. Um, so that's kind of a dimension of naming. Um, there is the there is the namespace of reader macros in Clojure. They're data literals, but any package that you load into the class path in Clojure has a, can provide a data readers.clj file, which will automatically get executed and contribute a data literal syntax to Clojure. And those have an opportunity to conflict. So I think we're at a Lisp four now. Um, so my my point with this is that. Uh, in my view now, this is actually a really small and maybe even not very important distinction between these two things. Um, because the same is true for common Lisp. If you go and catalog all the different uh, 
things that can be named globally or interfere with each other at a global level. Um, it's a lot of stuff. And um, I'm not sure you can get away from having a lot of stuff. I think you're just going to have a lot of stuff. Um, for my part, I, I think it, the Lisp2 thing contributes to the old timey feel, which I, I enjoy. I haven't written enough Lisp code to leverage any of the purported benefits, I don't think. Um, but it certainly, I don't, in the little Lisp code I've written it, I d don't feel like it's gotten in my way. Mm. Um, but that, that is just my opinion. Right. Which is interesting because I, I can I can uh, testify myself that uh, the same way that uh, you were uh, drawn to common Lisp in, in this kind of, uh, oh, oh, this looks interesting. Let's have a closer look at it. I, uh, I have this kind of hobby where I uh, study scheme implementations or at least uh, try to follow what's happening in the scheme world and um, trying, trying some implementations on and trying to understand how it works and understanding the, the standard systems, the serifies and stuff like that. Um, and in that respect, um, the, 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 the major maybe difference, uh, except of course the Lisp 1 is two thing, is that the scheme is evolving because the standard itself, it is also a standard like common Lisp, but it's right. a standard that, that is, that is um, uh, that has revisions and which is ongoing with the committee that is being um, so maybe maybe you want to to address this this aspect uh, just just uh, just a thought like um, scheme is going to change uh, common list not so that's interesting right well um, it's interesting and strictly speaking is true but uh... I think the implementations of Common Lisp have continued to evolve. And because of the culture of platform interop, uh, the, the culture rather of implementation interop, um, like for example, there's a, there's a fairly recent feature in uh, Common Lisp called package local nicknames. And that's, in Clojure, we've had that from the beginning and that's the ability to give pack, uh, namespaces aliases. So you can use, um, some abbreviated version of a package name forward slash and then the you know something some symbol from that package um, but that's not in the common list standard and so you have to either deal with you know collisions or fully qualify uh, you know um, and so this is a feature that all major common lists have now and it's non-standard but in practice like you can pretty much count on it existing and um you know, that's at odds with the spirit of the standard because that is strictly speaking, that is not conformant, you know, uh, or, or not, um, or rather not, uh, there, there's particular terms that people in common list use when they refer to different features and whether or not they're implementation dependent or conformant. Um, but th that, that adds gray area to say the least, you know, it complicates the situation. Um, but, um, Another, the other thing that comes to mind is there's a, there, well, there, there are a few things. There's a sequence of protocol in, uh, a, you know, non-standard but universally supported sequence protocol in Common Lisp. Um, so, which is to say that, yes, yeah, strictly, strictly speaking, Common Lisp, the standard is unlikely to change anytime soon, but there is movement. There is activity. Um, and, uh, you know, the culture is what makes it tolerable to me it's not like other languages where they're changing or packages where, or libraries where they're changing fundamental things on a on, on a whim um there is a culture of backward compatibility which is here to stay i think yeah anybody else want to chime in simon do you want to explain a little bit maybe why um or how 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 transitioning from common list to closure is it, it if, if that's what you've done. Hi. Um, yeah, so it's, it's hard to remember a little bit because it's about, it's coming up for 10 years ago, I suppose. Um, mm. I'm trying to think if I can say anything intelligent. <laughs> um, uh, I think it probably took me a good while, uh, uh, maybe uh, it's probably a gradual thing, but um, there were definitely things I tripped up on and, 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 um, I mentioned the thing with with um, 
symbols and, and packages. Um, so I think uh, this might not be quite right, but I think one of the reasons why closure symbols are as they are is is to make it easier to write hygienic macros. Um, now I'd have to think to kind of tie that back into to what we were talking about earlier. Um, but I think um, I think when when you get the, the thing with um, uh, the symbols being interned at read time, um, I think I, I'd really have to think about this, but I think that draws you into getting um, that's one of the things that makes it harder to write hygienic macros in common Lisp, I think. Um, and so closures approach, I think part of the rationale for that was maybe um, to make hygienic macros easier. Uh, yes, so I can speak to that relationship. Um, cool. Again, yeah, it's, it is a really complicated part of both languages. Um, so I could be wrong. But uh, yeah, in common Lisp, there is a function and syntax for making what they call uninterned symbols. And so like the gensim function in common Lisp returns one of these. And that's a th that gives you an object that is a symbol type with a distinct name and a distinct identity. So it's not EQ or identical question mark to any, any other symbol in the system if once you get it back from gensim. Um, <clears throat> and so those identifiers can be used in code that you're generating in a macro for things like the name of something in a let binding. And that's the, um, I think maybe that's what you might be getting at Simon because that's, because that thing does not inhabit a package uh, regardless of the package in effect when the macro is called the identity of that symbol is guaranteed not to conflict with the identity of any symbols either in the callers package or anywhere else in the in the system and okay. um, we don't we don't need to go out of our way to do that in closure because the symbols naturally are uninterned right yep Dante, are you uh Common Lisp or Clojure? Yeah, both in a, in a way. I have been doing Common Lisp for longer, but uh, but at work, uh, I'm not for five years or so. I'm I'm using Clojure. Um, yeah, I, I think um, um, that's uh, also uh, this uh, Jensen thing is, is also a thing which uh, interacts with uh, Lisp one or Lisp two uh, because um, if you have a Lisp one, then you have a much higher um, or the, the, the hygiene of a macro is a much um, much more important because mm. um, if you uh, if you know that only operators can be uh, shadowed accidentally, then you can be a bit uh, you, know, you have a, a lot more leeway in in writing your macros, um, and uh, you only need to, to uh, use Jensen for your uh, variables that you introduce in your macro body. Um, and uh, but in, uh, if you have this one, then it's both the operators and the values, and they are all in the name namespace. Uh, the variables and the and the operators um, are all in the name same namespace. So, uh, for example, you can't. Uh, so, so there's a much more possibility for conflict. Yeah, um, and so you need to 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 be very careful about gensimming anything. Um, and um, so what, what Clojure does is uh, that it includes um, the uh, facility that for one, every symbol that you use in a, in a, in a macro body is automatically uh, fully qualified. And it's mm -hmm. not the same, or you have to use, or you have to fully qualify it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit the other way around. Um, and um, so um, when you uh, use your um, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to. No, really, you have to. You have to fully qualify it. But the backtick uh, syntax sugar does that for you. Yeah. So so it automatically fully qualifies all the symbols that are in the backtick body, and um, you also can have uh, this uh, thing where you can uh, extend a variable name used in the macro with a little hash sign, then there, there's the auto gensim. So there's, this is automatically expanded uh, to a gensim name. So in effect, there's a little number, 
yeah. an increasing number it attached to it. So it's always a different symbol and you get all this hygiene from that. So it's, it's um, much easier in, in closure to write a really hygienic macro. Yeah? So, so you, you get all this um, uh, accidental uh, shadowing out of the, out of the way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And in communist, um, you have to be a bit more explicit about it. Yeah? So, so you have to, uh, many macros that are a bit more complicated start with, uh, okay, make these gensums. There's a macro for making gensums uh, in a con more convenient way, but uh, uh, that's, uh, you will always use that. And, um, but uh, you don't have to be so careful about uh, not uh, accidentally shadowing um, 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 function names with your variables. Yeah, you, 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 you can't have a let keys something and uh, oh, oops, uh, my keys function is gone. Yeah, mm. that's uh, something that uh, tripped me up. And when I came to closure, it, it was uh, always, oh, I can't use keys. It's it's a function in the in, in the core. Yeah. I can't uh, I can't use ends because it's it's an uh, operator in core. It's it's uh, I, I want to destructure numbers n and ends. Oh, damn. Um, <laughs> vals. Uh, no, you can't say vals. You have to say values. Is yeah. values okay? Uh, yeah, values is okay. Uh, yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's I, I feel more restricted by it being a list one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the other hand, it's of course um, always this thing, uh, this funny thing about, um, okay, if I use higher order functions and I want to pass a function, then I have to reference it from the function name So I have to put this hash signs uh, quote before it to pass it. And it's always a bit more hassle, a bit more, uh, why doesn't this work? Oh, I forgot this. Yeah, and, and when I'm writing a lot yeah, of paper I mean, and I come to communist, then I sometimes mix this up. But uh, That is uh, uh, the point that uh, for me, in, in terms aesthetically, high order functions and at least one is just, this is just elegance uh, embodied for me. I mean, to be able to say, you know, uh, map uh, and then the name of the function and the collection, that's it, without going to the, to this, uh, yeah. But uh, that's, that's maybe just an aesthetic point and really not, not really important. Well, the aesthetics are important, I think, to the extent that uh, yeah. you know your your tastes are in alignment with what you're using, because it's only it's only a pain if you are forced to use something that. You exactly. Know. Yeah. Um. A suggestion was made to do a REPL, which I'd I'd love to do. We could. Oh, great! If you have could, to, uh, for sure. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Let's do it. <clears throat> I'm glad there are other people here with actual Lisp experience because I'm a bit of a fraud in that regard. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I don't use Lispworks myself for anything. I'll occasionally open it up to poke around, uh, test things out, but I'm glad that it exists. And what it is, is it is a commercial Lisp implementation and IDE. And someday I will buy a license to it because I think it's neat and I want to support the work. But the license costs like $3,000 and I want other things first. So it's not going to happen anytime soon. But you can download this thing for free and run it. Um, it doesn't have any kind of nagging features. I think it turns off after two hours or something like that, but it'll warn you. Um, but what it is, is it's the closest thing we have today to the kind of environment that the Lispers of yore had, where there were first class package browsers, first class, uh, you know, UI support for the stuff in common Lisp. Um, so we can do, you know, I've got a, a what's called a listener over here. A listener is a is a term you'll see used in uh, the common Lisp world to refer to a REPL. Um, but usually the kinds of REPLs you can expect in common list are, are more featureful than what we're used to in the closure world. And I think uh, that's just, again, part of being the platform is they have special affordances. Uh, so this is the most important thing to write first. Oh, excuse me, my phone is blunking. Um, one second, I uh, just need to turn off my video. It's a family member who doesn't want to be seen. 
We'll access the pantry behind me. Everybody still there? Yeah. Sure. All right, great. So, um, right. So we have the listener. We can type stuff in. You know, everything that we would expect. I'm actually I've been writing closure code into the REPL and it's working magically. <laughs> um, but we can let's look at some of the things that we were discussing. Uh, we were talking about Lisp one versus Lisp two. So there is a function list in common Lisp, and it's very attic, takes things, puts them in a list. Um, here, I wrote a function called my function that takes an argument called list and returns it. Um, now in closure, this would, this function parameter would shadow the list function. And so, Let me do this. Okay, so this is kind of confusing. Let's see what it does. Weird, okay, so, um, we have an argument list. So this is a lexical variable, which means it is a symbol who, so a symbol in Lisp is a, is mutable in the sense that mu, uh, symbols have a metadata protocol. Uh, this is, is back to a, a big, a significant difference in syntax, which is in closure, you can attach metadata to almost any, anything that's readable. Um, there's some, subtlety there into whether the metadata is copied if you add something to that. Like there's a concept of losing metadata in Clojure. Like if you have a vector with metadata on it and then you conj something onto that vector, is the mm -hmm. vector you get back, does it still have the metadata? Um, and I think it does in most cases, but there might be cases when it doesn't, but in the area of subtlety in Clojure. Uh, in Common Lisp, there is no general metadata thing. There's not syntax for it, um, but symbols are, mutable in the sense that they carry a property list, which is uh, a set of associations between other symbols and values. And they also have what are traditionally called the function and value cells. And these are basically slots or fields on the symbol that can either carry a value at some in some environment or a function value. And by default, if you just refer to a symbol without any qualification, it's the value cell that is going to be accessed. And so that's effectively how Lisp2 is implemented is its admission of the symbol as a mutable container. And then it's the admission of a syntactic default to uh, interpret occurrences of symbols as accesses of their values and not necessarily accesses of their function values. Right. So in this function, we have this parameter list. Lexically, it takes the value of the parameter that's activated on the stack when it's activated on the stack. And then, so now list is a variable, but look on this, I don't have line numbers here. I have a call to the list function. Um, well, because that's a syntax in Lisp called an operation form, we have a symbol, a list with a symbol and some number of arguments. Um, that's distinct as a reference to the function cell of list and which we can look at. Oh, whoops. So there's another operator called function, which takes a symbol and will give you the actual function value. So that's like the instance of the function as opposed to the instance of the name that contains the function inside of it. Um, 
yeah, so it's that this object is what we're extracting here as the first argument to apply. So you can see these two return the same object and that's because this hash quote is a reader macro that basically expands to this. You can think of it as expanding to that. Um, yep, yeah, so this occurrence of list is not a function call. We could say that's uh, the symbol appears in value position maybe, but you could say whether or not we're accessing the symbol or the function is you know, syntactically dependent and lexically dependent. Any questions about that? <clears throat> Cool. Maybe, maybe you want to show func all because test uh, in higher order function func all or something like that. Oh well, there's a. Uh, yeah, I mean, map car is what closure we know in closure is map. So. Um, map car is a higher order function and it takes a function as its first argument and then a list as its second argument and it iterates through the list and applies the function to each element. Um, I believe, so in Lisp there's a concept of designator which is uh, basically it's kind of like a polymorphism system in the sense that it acknowledges that uh, intuitively, we, we, we want to use a set of objects to represent the same idea. And in this case, the symbol one plus. Now, strictly speaking, this is a, a quoted symbol. But in a context where we were expecting for the quoted symbol to represent a function, um, we would want it to designate a function. And so I think in the case of Mapcar, We could also pass it the symbol one plus, and it will infer for us that hey, I'm passing you the symbol for its for its use as a function, and so we don't need to wrap it in. Hmm. So there's a lot of ways to do this, and they're all different variations of, you know, this general idea that um, we have a symbol that can have multiple meanings. And there are different contexts in which the meanings will be uh, inferred automatically. And, but we also have tools to make explicit references to aspects of the symbol. So yeah, I mean, not very savory, honestly, from a closure perspective, like these are all the details that <laughs> uh, closure helps us avoid. But at the same time, there is some value in them existing because you have, um, uh, you have s more flexibility along certain certain dimensions. Um, foremost among them is this uh, lack, the, the fact that this function variable does not shadow the list function. And so honestly, yeah. like, I, I'm kind of refreshed because like in Clojure, you know, you do things like you have to make, you have to, you know, you don't want to yeah. shadow Clojure list. So you make a little variable version or you know, that's better, the Haskell style. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, is it easy to inspect, to inspect the environment and see all the symbols as data? Yeah, so um, there are definitely, so in the same way that a closure, this isn't gonna work. So, you know, Clojure offers functions for inspecting the global environment, looking at packages, looking for things in packages. And mm -hmm. Common Lisp is the same way. There are um, uh, functions for doing that. I'm actually gonna, uh, I'm gonna share my whole screen. That's not the one I'm looking for.
So I'm at the hyper spec. Um, in Lisp, they refer to the set of functions and symbols relevant to some concept as that concept's dictionary, um, mm -hmm. which I like. So this is the packages dictionary. And you can see there's a, a set of symbols. And each symbol is defined either by its uh, function, whether it's a function, uh, class, macro, variable. So we can look at, yeah, let's look at find symbol. Yeah, so find symbol takes a string, a package designator. So this is something that represents a package. And let's, let's try this. So let's, let's do, um, let's see what it says about this. Okay, so interesting thing popped up. Notice how two lines of output printed. This means that this function returned two values, which is, you know, mathematically bankrupt, because what does that mean? <laughs> but what it is, is it's an efficiency. Um, normally, in a programming language, there's conceptually a register that a return value is put into. And a normal programming language maintains one such register. But uh, Common Lisp exposes some... Um, performance related features. And one of them is this idea that a function can return multiple values. And it's based on the observation that um, a function can box up multiple values into a list, for example, or a vector in closures case. But that means that you need to allocate a fresh vector that's immediately going to be thrown away by the consumer. It's going to be destructured and then um, GC'd. Um, so if you just have, if you have a concept of multiple values, then you can maintain a set of registers, say like a hundred. And instead of allocating a new vector when somebody wants to return multiple things, you just return a special value that indicates there are multiple values involved and then you could pass like an offset into the registers or something. But at the end of the day, there's no allocation happening necessarily. So no pressure on the GC, no allocation. Um, and the caller has very fast access to the values returned. Um, this is somewhat famously not in Clojure. Clojure doesn't have multiple values. Probably the biggest reason is because Java doesn't have multiple values, and you can imagine how crazy that would be to try and do. Um, but uh, Clojure actually defended his decision. Uh, Rich Hickey defended his decision in a separate way. He a couple of years, or maybe like ten years ago, he had a discussion that uh, uh, there is a there is a um, this is written down, but he had a discussion with Cliff Click, uh, who's a more or less the implementer of Java's hotspot, and Daniel Weinreb, who is one of the Symbolics founders. And I think Weinreb mentioned to Rich this lack of multiple values, and Rich suggested that multiple values were not even really desirable for performance reasons because of advances in garbage collection since um, common list was standardized, in particular ephemeral garbage collection. So the cost of allocating something on the stack from the garbage collector is very, very low nowadays um, on Java or any, on, on, on any system that has different, um, uh, that partitions new objects based on how long they've been around. And so I, objects that haven't been around for very long are the first to get collected usually. And so what that means is that the cost of allocating things is much lower um, uh, in practice. At least that was Rich's argument. Um, but anyway, in case Rich is wrong, we have multiple values in common Lisp, and which is what we're seeing here. So find symbols returning two values, symbol plus, and then inherited, which is a keyword that means it's present in the package as an in, oh, uh, ah, yes, it's inherited through use package. So what this means is that like we're in a package CL user, which is analogous to Clojure's user, user package. And plus is a symbol from a different package. But when we type it in without a namespace or a package qualification, uh, in this current package, it's going to be interpreted to mean something else. So it's very similar to Clojure's uh, refer. You know, it's the same way that you can type plus in the user namespace and it becomes Clojure's. We can do this. So we can look up the package where the symbol 
is installed or interned and it says the common list package, which is different from the one we're in. Yeah. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time left. Well, no, I do. Let's see, we've been, oh yeah, I have to go soon. But um, there were a few things I wanted to show. One of, one of them was class common list object system. It's not going to happen. Um, but I will show you this, which is the loop macro. It's simultaneously, I think, one of the most offensive macros to people coming from Clojure. And I, I think also one of the most illustrative of the differences between common list and Clojure. Um, but there's a macro in common list called loop. And let me just write out a thing. All right, so it looks like I'm writing in blub here, right? <laughs> it's like straight up imperative stuff. Um, but what this is, is this is a DSL embedded in common Lisp. And it is a really powerful slash complicated language for performing iteration. Mm -hmm. So in common enclosure, we have lazy sequences, we have uh, recursion, we have uh, the loop recur construct for doing iteration. Uh, and those are all functional in the sense that they don't imply or they don't necessitate mutation of anything. So you don't need to name something in order to mutate it so that you can add something to it. Uh, loop, loop recur is, is like probably Clojure's most, I don't know, I feel is one of the most elegant things in Clojure because uh, it's a functional iteration construct and it bottles up the concept of iteration in an interesting way. I agree, and that's the equivalent of the. I mean, if if you had real-time the recursion in the JVM, then you wouldn't you wouldn't even need the recur. You could just use the same symbol that you use to define your like in scheme. You can, uh, you can do very elegant recursion. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, common Lisp is not it, the focus of common Lisp is not functional programming. Um, it's not impossible to do, but when it's done, it's done by convention and with the help of libraries. But all of the iteration constructs that are in common Lisp, other than recursion, are uh, you know non-functional, or at least admit mutation uh, or imperative stuff into their paradigm, uh, into their DSL. Um, so loop. Um, is a basically a small programming language embedded in common Lisp, and it's uh, for doing iteration. And I guess you can use it in a functional way. Like here, we're collecting a list. We're not strictly mutating anything, but it supports a concept of oh, whoops. Yeah, so I think I, it's not clear to me exactly what's going on here, but there's multiple keywords supported in loop. For creates the bounds of an iteration, and then when is a conditional inside the body. Uh, do lets you do a side effect at that point in the iteration, and then collect will contribute a value to an implicit um, set of, or an implicit list of, of values you're accumulating. Um, I think that, yeah, the direction I'm going with this is just that, first of all, it's pretty crazy coming from Clojure. To have this involved of a DSL be supported out of the box is pretty wild. Um, but I think it also shows, and for me, it has shown that um, you there is the value this delivers is, is this doesn't rely on any runtime abstractions. So there's no need for a lazy sequence abstraction. Loop expands into the lowest level possible common list code, like basically go-tos is what it expands into. Go-tos with mutating and 
gooders and stuff like that. So it's high level in the sense that it gives you a high level language to work with that looks pretty much like Python or something, but it's low level in the sense that it produces code that depends on only common list lowest level runtime affordances. Um, and that's a trade-off, obviously. Um, you know, this doesn't participate in a system of runtime constructs or abstractions the way sequences and closure do. Um, but at the same time, you're not paying for such a system. So um, yeah, just kind of conceptually interesting uh, thing that occupies a point in the des design space that I don't think we um, use or are supposed to use in Clojure <laughs> because we have lazy sequences and, and recursion and so forth, if that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think with that, I should probably go, but maybe I'll take one more question. I'm not sure we have the time for that, but I can't uh, help uh, asking the one thing you didn't talk about and uh, are in this whole universe of yours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I enjoyed working with R and I think R is, I mean, by McCarthy's definition, R is a lisp. I mean, it is written in data structures that you have accessible at runtime and it's an online compiler and everything. Um, I think R, so I, did not find myself getting obsessed with it the way that I'm obsessed with Common Lisp. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because I'm just immune to being obsessed with things that are popular. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I certainly never really had any problems with R and I think it occupies, again, another point in the design space that's very valuable to lots of people. Um, an interesting maybe thing about need, R. Maybe you need S expressions in your life. Say that again? Maybe you need S expressions in your life. <laughs> maybe maybe that's what it is yeah i think um you know like common lisp r is also has kind of an old-timey feel it's descended from a, from a pretty old language called s and um the ideas go back decades and uh that's fun bye tori thanks for coming um there is a very interesting thing about R that is unique to R among Lisps and among all languages that I've ever known, which is that R has F expressions, Fexpers. So R is a call by need language, lazy evaluation. And R's, so, you know, common Lisp has first class, a lot of things in common Lisp are first class, but one thing that's not first class are the lexical environment, which is that inside a function, you don't have access to that function's lexical scope. And that's all been compiled away into identifiers that are gone by the time your function actually runs. So this is something the compiler manages for you at compile time. But in R, the environment, the runtime environment of a function is attached to the function object. And you can actually look at the variable, the lexical variables inside a function, like from the REPL, and even modify them. So like if in, inside a function body, there's imagine like there's a let binding and the outermost let in the function binding says x1, and then there's a bunch of stuff. In R, you can do the moral equivalent of after that function has been defined, go in there, mutate its environment, internal environment, um, which, uh, you know, again, pretty egregious from the closure functional perspective. <laughs> I think that's possible. But uh, it also gives you a level of metaprogramming capability that is, I think, unparalleled. Uh, except by other lisps. So um, very, very interesting language. Um, and I think, you know, the, the reason that F expert thing did exist in lisps, lisps for decades before common lisp. And I think it was thrown out for performance reasons long before common lisp came to be standardized. Um, but one thing that uh, this is kind of another observation I have is that um, there's a concept of computer performance and then there's a concept of human performance. And it's okay for something to have very poor computer performance if it unlocks some kind of human performance because yes, our relative things kind of slow because of this first class environments thing, 
but you can use it to make a really nice DSL on top of something that's written in C++, for example. So it gives you a test bed in which to prototype uh, con constructs and semantics that are valuable to people. And then later, if at all, you have a layer on which you can make those things more efficient. Um, and it makes me regret the not adding R to my little platform at abstraction level chart. Like that's sort of a bar chart, really. Um, you know, R sits even higher than closure, maybe. On the on, or, well, I guess it's a. Uh, it's complicated. I have to think about that more. But um, it too offers semantic affordances at a very high level, and there are trade-offs with the ones it does offer, and it occupies a unique like closure occupies a, a point in the design space that has benefits for people who do a certain kind of thing or like a certain kind of thing. Um, yeah, I, I still really like it. And uh, um, I, I, uh, I enjoyed the process of learning it. It also, it also like closure is significantly influenced by common lisp, which mm. is fun. So it's kind of a, a sibling to closure in that way. Interesting. With that, I think I shall leave you fine people to your well, own programming. That was a phenomenal talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, You're welcome. Great. Yep, thank you. I enjoyed that. You're very welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send the slides to the Daniels. And, um, and there's links on there on how to contact me and stuff to look at and so forth. But uh, uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks a lot, Adam.